is pretty much my regular day anyway. Um, but how have it, has it been for you? Like finding your kind of like start time, your end time, like it's hard too. Cause you like, I don't know about you, but I use my computer, you know, after hours, obviously. Right. And like, do I just shut Slack and com- like, do I shut down some of that software or like, do I just ignore it? Or sometimes I like close my computer entirely. Cause I'm like, no, I keep getting distracted and wanting to like, see what they're doing on Slack. It's, yeah. it's weird. It, it's definitely weird. It's also, it's interesting. I think I, I'm probably like three quarters of the way to where you are in terms of like, I've, I'm comfortable working from home. I, I work remotely, not infrequently, but it's, it's usually there's a reason, right? It's not just every day I'm waking up and doing a thing. It's usually you're, you're, there's some reason you're not feeling well, I'm not feeling well, or I have a bunch of calls in the morning. And so I do those from home and then I go in something like that. But it's, it's been definitely felt, it's de- felt different. I've also been interested in what people's home screens look like in quarantine world versus in uh, previous world. Like I just took Google maps off my home screen. Really? Anywhere. And I haven't taken the time to adjust my home screen, but I guess that makes sense. I put Zoom on it. I'm using Zoom so much. I mean, I haven't put Zoom on my phone yet. I don't think I'm ready for that. I like really, I'm highly resistant to soft, like work software on my phone. Like I got away with it for like six years, not having work email on my phone, like, or Slack, which mm-hmm. is just a crazy thing to imagine now because I just feel like I have to be much more involved now, I guess. But um, yeah, I, I got away with it for a long time. I'm still not ready to commit to Zoom. I'm actually not like, this might be slightly unpopular opinion, particularly right now, but I'm not a huge Zoom fan. What are you, have you been talking to your family through video at all or using FaceTime or using? Phone? No, I've been talking to him on the phone, but my dad did. I think he's like starting to get to the point where he wants to talk to people face to face. So he set up a dinner for us tonight. I don't know if we're actually going to like so sit and get, eat dinner together, but what would that be I don't know. I asked reason? him about it. I think he wants to do FaceTime to be honest. Cause it's just mm-hmm. easiest for my mom, you know, and whoever else. Yeah. I mean, um, I think, I, to me, the use case of zoom is interesting the outside of work use case, you know? Um, yeah. What are people using to like, like just hang around with? Yeah, I think it's a, mostly Zoom. I think like that's kind of taken on a completely consumer use case like really quickly. I yeah. I would love to be like in Zoom HQ for the last two weeks and just like fly on the wall that shit and see how like what their attitudes are. I'm sure they're like incredibly burnt out because they're probably just like hustle, hustle, hustle right now just to like serve demand. And then also this sense of like, wow, like we are we get to be like a hero in this moment, but also trying to like temper that obviously with the fact that like their sudden growth and success, not that they weren't growing or successful before, but like this big peak is also like the byproduct of a essentially force of God, right? Like act of God in a terrible way. So it must be just a weird environment to be in. Do you know what I mean? I mean, obviously they're not in their HQ. They're all at home too. So... (laughs) They don't have like have that shared emotional experience of going through this in exactly the same way, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's um, and uh, I'm getting a text from John. Does he have the right no the right link? To Probably him? not. Actually, Chris did just email him. Yeah, I just sent him an email, um, but I don't know if you want to send him just the link that I just sent you just to be redundant yeah, let me and see. then I can uh, add him, promote him once he's uh, in the if, attendee if he, list. If he's in there, uh, we don't, you don't have the chat thing. Okay, let me see here. Sure. Um, see, I'm see looking that. on the list of him, but I did send him a um, panelist link. Oh, yeah. I'm sending him something. I'm hoping this link works. Thank you for all of our listeners for being patient with us for a second. John was on a board meeting call, so we're lucky to, that he could squeeze us in just after that. But once he gets here, we'll get cracking. And uh, hopefully you guys have your questions ready to go because my list is short. I planned that you guys would bring lots of the cues. If you don't, me and Matt will just 
talk about some of our shared interests. <laughs> <laughs> Jordan uh, and I played Fortnite, this new game that she's telling me about. Like, Matt, this thing is going to blow up. And I watched her do all these kills. And I think you won. Hey, that was you're the first person I saw win. Hey, John. Oh, really? Hey, hey, John, how are you? Good, Jordan Cook. <laughs> <laughs> are you laughing at me? I, all I said was, hello, how are you? Yeah, it's nice to see you. Um, you I'm too. okay. How are you doing? I'm as good as I can be, all things considered. I'm yeah. sa safe and, and I'm here in my house, which is what I, where I prefer to be most of the time anyway. So I'm good. How are you? I like your background. Is that uh, Betaworks Studio? <laughs> What's work studio? Um, I I started a uh, like ten days ago, two weeks ago, whenever this um, whenever this hell started. I uh, I threw it up as a background, and and somebody d took a screenshot and put it out there. My assistant saw it and started like messaging, saying, "Oh my God, John's in the office! Get him out of the office!" So. Oh my God, that's funny. Yeah, that's yeah. what I. That's honestly what I thought until the green screen kind of. Uh... Until, yeah, but when you bit. start yeah. moving, yeah, yeah, it's just like the hands go wrong, yeah. Yeah, and the guy behind you is is upsettingly still, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, well, I thought that we could just maybe start with talking a little bit about, well, first off, where are you guys? Are you are you guys in New York? Yeah, in, in the New York area. I'm outside of New York, but we're in the New York right. area. Good where smart. are you? Are you in California? I'm in Brooklyn right now. I'm at my I'm apartment. Brooklyn. Yeah, I'm here. Hey. I'm just sitting tight. Um, huh. Did and I see you both dressed up? I have sweats on underneath, so just to just to be really forthcoming with everyone. Um, I'm wearing a t-shirt. What about? That's dressed up. I got. I got. I put on a. <laughs> Perfect. I like how we're all like uh, mullet mullet dressed. Uh, <laughs> business in the front and party in the back. Um, <laughs> I wanted to start maybe with just like the thing that's most top of mind to most people, which is obviously what's happening with the coronavirus pandemic. Like how are you guys, how are you advising your, your startup portfolio right now? Like what, what advice are you getting from them and what questions are you getting from them as well? Like in terms of how they should go about things, I'm sure that's top of mind to most of our, our participants right now. Yeah. I mean, um, let me start off and then Matt, I'm sure you'll have more thoughts on this, but um, the, you know, the set of sort of rules of thumb and there's a lot of blog posts out there about runway, about like, you know, figuring out your cost base and figuring out what you can do to extend runway. So all, all the standard stuff we're doing. Um, I think in addition to that, I mean, I would say that Founders are dealing with this really differently. I mean, obviously they have very different, every founder has a you know, different kind of business, but I think the personality of founders really coming to bear in a way which I, you know, I haven't seen before, where, you know, some founders are viewing this as, um, as you know, some founders are just frozen. I mean, there are people who are just like really struggling to you know, adapt their business and to adapt personally, because you know, so I think the, you know, the the idea that we would just pause for you know two weeks and then everything would come back, um, it's now apparent that it's going to be longer. And when things come back, it's going to be different. And yeah. so I, I think that you know, there's some people who are just frozen, who are just frozen, and they're really having a hard time with that. Um, and then there's other founders who are viewing this as opportunities. Uh, you know, there's ways that they're pivoting their businesses, adapting their businesses. There's certainly businesses that relate to everything from, you know, future words, telements into, you know, many distributed businesses, businesses that have had uh, sort of behavioral impediments, as I think about them, to moving to be completely digital, right? Yeah. Like for years we've talked about we've talked about digital cash right the reality is here in the states you know cash and checks worked pretty well and so there was kind of like this behavioral impediment to like going 100% digital cash now that's gone right because those things now not only um, are harder to do they have a cost to them and so so there's people who are taking advantage of it. And then I would also lastly say, because um, uh, is that, you know, distribution has changed. 
right? So I haven't for 10 years seen uh, anything like this kind of distribution, right? That there's basically organic sharing of new and creative things, whether they be an app that you've never heard of or whether it's a hack that somebody did or whether it's an idea or whether it's something under development. There's, you know, the, um, the companies are seeing, uh, quite a few companies are seeing large, large spikes in organic um, distribution. Because people are just in the mode of sharing what they're doing and what they're into right now, right? Like they're just... People are in high with me. Mode. People, I think that a lot of people's um, comms channel has shifted or their communications channel has shifted into small private groups, right? So I think there's a lot of people in WhatsApp, WeChat, Telegram, Slack, you know, you know, private trusted groups. And so sharing is happening in those groups. I think email has been, um, at least in my experience, has been deprioritized. And so, mm -hmm. um, and so sharing is happening in a different place and organic sharing is happening again. And that, and that, that, that is amazing and huge for startups because, you know, if you think about it, Facebook and others, but particularly Facebook basically productized organic sharing and then they monetized it. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for, first it was all, you know, sort of chaotic and organic and just happened very, you know, distributedly. And then, you know, Facebook managed to productize that and then they over time flipped that into pay. And right. so I think that is changing and that's a big deal for startups. Matt, what, what, what are you seeing? I mean, I think I, I kind of divide the companies <laughs> into a couple of different categories. There's companies that where the main things they're dealing with are uh, sort of risk mitigation. Uh, there's, there's companies where there's some in real life element or, they're, or just they're, uh, there's human behavior that's changing away from their, their kind of use cases. I think there's companies then in the second category which are kind of more, I guess, in the opportunistic category where there is a, they're seeing a bunch of sh a shift of behavior towards them. I think John's example of remote work strikes me as one where if you had three out of five of your teammates who were remote, you kind of use the product and now five of five teammates are out remote and all of a sudden this thing becomes your operating system. And so they're seeing a lot of, and we were talking about Zoom before John, John joined, um, co companies where the problems they have are mainly around their sort of, their, their, as a business, the business problems are, are positive, right? And so in both cases, those companies may say, okay, what do I do to manage cash? What do I do to manage, um, my, my costs, but they're sort of doing them for opposite reasons. One is to manage, to figure out how you're gonna grow and, and then thinking about raising money and, and are they, do they wait right now? Are they, is there a perspective that all the VC, the, the, from a runway perspective, if there's not much uh, time and they were planning to go out in three months, what does that mean for them? Do they need to go out now? Do they need to, um, if there, and if there's also, if there's more opportunity, do they go out now or do they wait? Because there's just so much uncertainty and their questions, at least the ones I, founders I've talked to is, when do you think is the right time to talk to an investors? Is it not the right time this week? Is it wait two weeks? Is it right now? And I think there's, there's just literally people have been reshaping their lives. Like the human beings who are making investments and the human beings who are doing, starting the companies are shaping their lives. They have kids who are there now homeschooling. They have kids who are, they have uh, a new stack that they're building. And so, um, communication stack that they're working on working through and so just waiting for that all to settle is one of the things we're talking about to founders about just waiting for that for a moment for that to settle so people can kind of get back to doing work yeah i mean and and so i mean for new media companies in particular where you guys are obviously spend you know a considerable amount of your time if there if there are new media companies out here and this is a question from anna melamed um one of our participants is there is there even a possibility to raise money and uh, as a new media company it seems like they would be in the position of that that category you were talking about where you can really take advantage of something um are you seeing a lot I of mean, hunger from investors in that sector right now is this a good time or no i i mean i think that if you if your business is direct, directly applicable to what is happening now and uh, you know, if you are, if you are producing media that is doing local alerts or local news or local um, uh, uh, you know, medical services or information around that, 
then I can see that it, it then yes, it's the right time. But if your if your business is not directly applicable to what people are experiencing right now, I mean, I think that generally, as Matt said, we are you know counseling people just to hold back from you know just going out and doing a pitch saying, hey, I've I've got an amazing idea about how to change the world because. I would, I would say of three reasons. First of all is, is that there's more uncertainty than in the market right now than we've seen in, you know, in generations, right? I mean, it's just, it is very unclear what the world's gonna look like. So it's very hard for people to, to make longer term bets around that. Secondly is, is that people's attention is just right now acutely focused. You gotta think that everybody has, you know, sort of somewhere between 10 and 90% of anxiety in their life right now, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, Matt and I have a colleague, a work colleague who's, you know, running, uh, been running a temperature for three days and is, you know, COVID positive, we think, but hasn't gotten tested. Um, you know, everybody is, everybody has somebody one or probably two degrees away from them who thinks that they may have this. So that, that anxiety is in, it is present in every person on this planet right now at some degree. And so mm -hmm. trying to get into their sort of, into their head with your sort of like amazing new idea um, that has nothing to do with, you know, what they're thinking about or what, you know, is consuming their attention right now is just challenging. And so, yeah. you know, we've seen in the last two weeks, we've seen two of our companies um, uh, get funded. Um, one of them is future work company. And then our one was a gaming company. Mm -hmm. And the game company is a brilliantly interesting gaming company. They're doing very well. They're obviously spiking right now. They went out to raise a couple of million. They got the term sheet, I think, for four to five. And then the other future. Who is were, it? We're not telling you. We'll tell. Where I was laughing, Jordan, is your friend on the wall. Um, My deer so, on the wall. Uh, Every Zoom yeah. call I do, people are like, "Is that a deer on your wall?" I'm like, "Yeah, it's a deer yeah. on my wall. I need to add it to my Twitter bio or something." What's the so name of your? Well, what's the name Exton. of you? Exton? Yeah, Exton. He's got a very fancy name. I didn't is... hurt him or stuff him or anything. It was shipped as a gift from my uncle, but I do like it. I like the decor. I feel <laughs> I feel less alone in my apartment with Exton here. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so we'll, we'll tell Exton later who the company yeah. is, but there are things getting funded out there, but they're really they are they're directly applicable to yes. what people are experiencing today. So if it's not directly applicable, what, what would, particularly considering this uncertainty and the, and the I, what I'm hearing are pretty lower valuations than people would want right now going into chats, is, is it your advice if you're not directly applicable to this coronavirus situation to just kind of hold if you can and wait? Or does it make yeah. sense to kind of rush now and try to get it done? Well, look. It, it, it's entirely predicated on the company. I mean, I think that if you already have conversations in flight, if you already have a term sheet, I would rush to get it done, right? Whatever right. your business is. If you have a term sheet, get it done. Or if you're close to a term sheet, get it done. If you if you haven't started pitching yet, I mean, Matt and I were coaching one of our founders, awesome seed company. They're doing well. They have nothing demonstrably to do with the, you know, the, what, the thing we're going through right now. And we were just coaching them to wait. They have cash until end of the summer and they would like to raise now, but, um, and they are probably have more anxiety about waiting, but just going out and, you know, putting out 20 emails of which you only get five back because of the um, potentially five other people who could be interested in the population of 20, five of them just didn't have the attention for it. Mm -hmm. is just it's like you just cut in half you know your potential group of investors that you could talk to and you did that because it's just bad timing so i'd wait like two weeks because i think that in two weeks time um we're, we're definitely going to have we're going to be more habituated to this new reality to this new normal um than we are than we are now i mean it's like so you're less day. so you're less worried necessarily about like the financial uncertainty as you are just about like the level of attention that you could be getting from someone right now. Like people's attentions yeah. are just so split. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm worried about that as an initial gating factor, right? Do I think that valuations are gonna come down? Yes. Do I think that deals, some deals that we've seen are either wildly or mildly overpriced, you know, given the climate today, yes. And so I think that we're gonna see valuation pressure 
Um, and we're going to see, um, you know, big changes in the market. I think, I mean, I think this is, um, this is going to be a, it's going to be a very, very different market for early stage funding, uh, in, in six to 12 months. But, but the immediate thing is getting, getting into the attention stream. There is also this, I mean, there's been some conversation online, but there's been typically a lag, right? When, you know, 2008, I remember that. And, or I remember in 2000, there's sort of this lag between venture pricing and early stage pricing and the sort of cataclysmic event, right? If you just go back to 2000 and dot com boom and like the initial cataclysmic events of, you know, some, some of the big marquee tech companies getting slammed, it took a while to go through the whole system. This time, it's just, it is, it, it, there's no containment to this contagion. It's like, it's, it's, it's affecting everybody up and down the value chain. And so I think we're gonna see a reset uh, much, much quicker on early stage valuations. Okay, let's move to another question from a participant. Steven Ratto said, Facebook is moving toward private and small groups with a focus on messaging and stories. Seem like, seems like Giphy is well positioned to provide brands with a way into these two channels. Is messaging the future of social? Matt, you wanna take a swing at that one? I mean, I think I'll, I'll hit the, the whether Facebook is positioned to do private groups. And I think John, since on the board of Giphy, may have a, have a good good point of view on I'm just playing with I'm just playing with bugs in I Zoom see what right you're now. doing. <laughs> <laughs> if he's not talking, he's not paying attention. <laughs> but, <laughs> is assuming taking Facebook as being separate from from WhatsApp and Instagram just as a product, I'm not sure that I'm not sure I've seen so much that Facebook um, is moving toward, I think they want to move towards private groups, but the examples of like Facebook messaging and stories, I don't really, I don't at least in my life see people, see people use it. I do see people moving to Telegram and to WhatsApp. So I know Facebook owns WhatsApp. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've, what I've seen people do doing on Facebook though is these, is or I guess I'm thinking of kind of mobile groups. I've seen big groups on Facebook that were dormant for a while become active. So location-based mm -hmm. groups, um, some interest-based groups, Facebook pages now. I mean, it, just in terms of figuring out, if you want to figure out if a restaurant delivers, um, going to their Facebook post, going to their Instagram post is actually a pretty good way to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Like the original idea of Twitter being a, an actual status update, like here's what's happening with me right now, as opposed to kind of here's a post I wrote or here's a pithy comment mm -hmm. comments, like actual status of am I open and I am I closed? Those those places do seem to be um, the best the best place for that. Um, we've been using Telegram because it holds I think two hundred thousand people in a private messaging group, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, it just in terms of having I, I've seen the move much more towards bigger groups. I don't know, John, if you have thoughts on how how that relates to to Giphy specifically. So I I think that um, I I do think kind of. I'm going to disagree with Matt here. Is I do think that the um, that we've seen that the, the, there is a real shift towards these private groups, um, big and small, um, and so so work and social every kind. And so I think that um, w when the data really, when we really see the data, my hunch is is that we'll see a ton of traffic on all these uh, private messaging groups. Giphy is. Giphy is a is a big piece of that because Giphy is sort of expression within that, right? I, I one of my uh, one of the things I managed to get done last week was we you know, worked with the Giphy team and we got a hand washing emoji done, um, and so uh, because there is no hand washing emoji and so Giphy has stickers and there is now, you know, they turned that around in two days. So the Giphy guys are they are working fast and furiously around you know around communication and expression within messaging and so uh, that is a it, it's it's become a huge piece of their business right it's uh it, it's it's accelerating through this but it's really um this the sticker side of giphy uh in the last 18 months has become uh you know a, a ton of their traffic so i would say yes and yes the, the one thing I would add is, I think, and this kind of relates back to the, are there opportunities to invest on the media side? If you're a media company now, do you even, you know, is there, is there a chance of raising someone I've asked? And it, I'm, I'm curious if either of you two have, have seen this. It seems like the communication channels are bifurcating into information 
and presence, and that those are really different. So that you have like a, maybe you have a, a, a group, a private group that's text-based, you know, communication, but we're sitting here on a, on a video chat, right? And like, it's sort of, why are we doing that? I think part of that is because there's this desire to see, to be present with other people when mm -hmm. nobody can be present with anybody else in person. And so you're seeing a lot of that shift online. Jordan was talking earlier about having dinner and having a FaceTime during that. And to me, that's a very different medium than messaging. It's not async, it's, it's purposely synchronous. It doesn't exist when you're offline. There's no like, I mean, you, I guess you get a push notification, you know that you that you missed a FaceTime call, but there's not really a, a, a oh, I have to go check my FaceTime to see if anybody messaged me. It's much more just in the moment. Can I be present here? I saw an hour before our call, Jordan tweeted out that this that this event was happening. It's very in the moment, which seems like that video message, that video part of in the moment seems very different than the information side of private groups. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, B. Gooder asked, what is some essential software you recommend for focus, productivity, and thriving when working from home? So I don't think, uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, B. Gooder, but it doesn't sound like you're talking about like Zoom and stuff. It's really about like, is there software that will help you be better at working from home as opposed to like teleconference software? I mean, so we have a, we have an investment, in a company, right? which is interesting. Um, it's a video chat where you put yourself on mute and the other person's on mute. It's, it was really designed for people who want to be able to put time uh, in their calendar to get a particular thing done. So blocking off an hour to do your email or an hour to write your blog post or whatever the thing is, it's not actually about communicating with other people, but the mechanic that they use is you commit to doing this thing and it opens up a video chat with another person, mutes it, you com or you communicate with each other and say, here's what I want to get done in the next hour, half an hour, whatever the time frame is. And then it puts you on mute and then you sort of do a catch up at the end, did I finish it? Sort of an interesting- Oh my God, that sounds terrible. <laughs> Wait, so what is that called? It's called Focus Mate. Focus me. I didn't mean terrible. I'm sure it's great, but I, and I, I think that I naturally do that. Like I get on the phone sometimes with my colleague, Richard, we, we do disrupt stuff together. We won't even talk, but we're both working on the same thing and we're, we will chime in. Oh, did you get that part? Yeah, yeah, I got that part. And we're working on the same, in the same system, in the same air table or whatever on the same goal. We're not actually talking. It's just like a little friendly accountability. So I get, I get the math behind it. But yeah. I still don't like it. <laughs> there's, there's, the, there's also behavior the kids I think have where where if you're in high school and you're doing your homework, just being on Skype with a couple of other people, mm -hmm. just even if you're not communicating, just kind of feeling like you're around your friends, you have to ask a quick question. So I think that's that's sort of in that bucket of it's a remote tool that people are using for productivity, but it's not actually um, it's not sort of a social tool specifically. So I, I I think I just dropped into the chat um, a a chart. So so one of the small private groups, Jordan, that we that we spun up is about uh, two weeks ago. We spun up a Telegram group. Matt mentioned, and there's about two hundred of us in there, and we're just sharing sort of information about changes that are going on and 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 information uh, that's useful across various uh, geographies and places. Um, somebody shared this chart yesterday that I put into the uh, Q&A. I don't know if you can, can you see it okay? Um, I can't see it. Did you put it into the chat or the q and I, I, I replied to be gooder. Oh, okay. Got it. And it says, and, and take note, it says I'm Matt Hartman, so which is. It does. Yeah, you're both yeah. Matt Hartman. <laughs> yes, Matt Hartman today. Dark blue um, is the real it, Matt Hartman. Light blue is John Borthwick. So, so what I thought was fascinating about this was this was um, app data, which was pulled um, yesterday. And so you could see this, we could talk about a lot of things here on this chart, but I was kind of really um, intrigued by the spiking productivity apps. And um, uh, the guy who posted this is somebody who uh, has a whole bunch of app, different app businesses. He's, he runs one of these businesses where they have like 30 different apps. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and he's seen this big, big spike in productivity. He mentioned in a scanner app um, that they have in their collection of apps. Um, so, um, and and I asked him about it, and he said to me, as he said, people are trying to replicate their office at home, mm -hmm. and so they need all the tools to do that. So, outside of, I, I would say, outside of Zoom and basic teleconferencing stuff, 
people are trying to recreate that sort of environment of productivity. And then on top of that, there are new things like Focusmate that Matt said that people are trying out, which are just new ways to work at home. But I think mm -hmm. the first thing people are doing is they're trying to replicate their office environment, which I think is that productivity spike. Do you guys use a, like a to-do list app? I'm always curious about that. I went through a time where I was on, what was it? Wonder, Wonder, Wonder List. And, yeah. um, then I did one of, uh, you know, there was a kid that came up with a pretty good app. I forget his name, but he's now like a big name founder, but he had a list app that I used for a while. And now I'm just in my regular Evernote. Um, but do you guys have like a, is it a daily? Is it a weekly? Like, how do you guys do this? I have, I use... John turned me on to this app called OmniFocus and it's got like 8,000 features and I use one, which is just a list of inbox. <laughs> I don't even take anything out of my inbox. I just, my whole, my whole to-do list is here organized by whether, I organize everything by, by where I need to be when it needs to get done. So I have an emoji for my computer. I have an emoji for trying something. So that's like a little game emoji. But I just use, uh, I use OmniFocus, but I use like three features and it just snooze and, and the list. Yeah, so I you use have, OmniFocus. Yeah, you use it too, OmniFocus, but you use more features, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I use I, I use more of the features. I mean, I it is a GTD uh, getting things done um, app that basically lets you s sort of organize all your all your stuff, right? Work and personal, yeah. and I use it for everything, right? I use it to capture everything that I that I wanna do, that I think I do wanna do, that I might wanna do, that I dream of doing, that I uh, am gonna to forget to do. I use it for everything. I maybe it... should try that. It would probably be better than my weekly Evernote <laughs> to-do list. One of the cool things about it is that you can, I, mean, I, I started out trying to use it this way, but then I just stopped, is you can add contexts to different things. So I know John, like John will have like a context for particular people he's talking to to know that, oh, these are the things I wanted to talk about when we were gonna talk. And it can you can kind of move things from your inbox into these different projects and different contexts, uh, which is kind of interesting. I'm also using, yep. I don't know if it's this productivity tool, but I'm using Superhuman. Uh, I've been using oh. it for six months and we're not investors. I just really love the product. It's just fast email. Basically, yeah. I, all the features I love about it are still available in Gmail. Labels I use pretty aggressively. Um, I also have a Zoom, a Zoom and Calendly uh, Zapier plugin. So whenever mm. somebody wants to meet, there's a Calendly link that creates a custom Zoom, but the and the Calendly link is tied to a calendar that I have that's uh, that's kept very specific at times that are open for like talking to founders, talking to portfolio companies, talking to other VCs, just sort of very sort of so I can track how often I'm spending time in different with different mm -hmm. uh, groups, our investors. And, uh, and then it, the, 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 uh, the Zapier integration for Calendly is pretty good. So you can tie it to a particular calendar. It's a sub calendar of your actual calendar. And then you can tie that in and, uh, and it'll create a custom zoom link so that like, if you and me are talking, John won't use your zoom link from later and just show up. <laughs> yeah. I sent you guys the wrong oh, zoom link, office. but you, <laughs> you can blame Chris, um, from Anna again, Anna Melamed. Uh, what new trend do you see in new media? Is it VR, immersive, interactive, AR, or something else? I mean, we we invest right right around the intersection of media and technology, and so we're particularly focused on sort of new technologies that enable new kind of media creation. So we've done a lot of work in the last couple of years around voice, and that's you know started off in the era of, of podcasting. And then it's sort of fast forwarded into sort of next generation voice interfaces and thinking about voice as, as the primary interface to reaching the network. You know, we have an accelerator program, which is on, uh, on deck running right now, a demo day next week that we, we have a set of voice companies in there that are all sort of audio voice first. And so definitely we think that voice is a very uh, uh, sort of underdeveloped interesting channel for innovation startup um and for for media i mean i think that you know uh, we're still very obsessed with podcasts um you know we had um two early podcast companies that uh spotify bought 
last year that we had seeded um, with Anchor and Gimlet. And uh, you know, we were really happy about that, but we got a bunch of other um, uh, podcast related companies that were uh, that we backed and that we um, that we look at and we listen manically to podcasts. We're big consumers of it. We we like to use all the stuff we invest in and we work with. So definitely voice. And then I would say visual, new visual interfaces as segments of sort of AR. Um, Matt, why didn't I pass that one yeah. to you? Yeah, I mean, I think, well, uh, so I was going to add, so the, uh, the, Anna, I think, who who posted, was asking about VR, so I wanted to hit that specifically and then talk about why AR is an area of interest. And then there's another category that's that's generative text that's that's really interesting. Um, I don't know if we call that media or not. I mean, I think about it as sort of social media and its content. So, uh, but so on on virtual reality, I think what we found is that on that we tend to focus on consumer. I think there's a bunch of interesting. Uh, companies in the B2B space that are using VR in interesting ways. Um, I, I think on the consumer side, we're just sort of waiting for that to really hit scale. Um, the, the, if we break VR down into kind of component parts, you have 3D models, right, that are the, 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 the assets that live inside of VR. Um, that, and then you have, and if you take those 3D models are what's part of what's powering augmented reality, right? That's the same tech you use to create the 3D model that lives in, in the Oculus game is, is what you use for a Snapchat filter, which is kind of interesting because it means all the work that was done a while ago on VR can get applied to a lot of the augmented reality. The thing that's different, I think, is the camera understanding what it's looking at. is ju That's just starting to happen. The ability to, and that's obviously doesn't exist inside of, uh, inside of VR, but it's getting pretty good. And what we saw a couple of years ago is that when Apple, uh, turned on its, its computer vision API. And, and uh, I think it was in like July of 2017, um, they did an update and it all of a sudden you had 300 million devices that, had, that were enabled for augmented reality. Now, I don't know that the holding your camera up to the world is the, and, and sort of guiding you around is the actual use case or is some people picture an augmented reality, but mm -hmm. the face filters are at scale. Uh, I think there's other use cases that are smaller that are, that are starting to get to scale. Um, and, then, and then the one other category I just wanna mention, because I think it's, I'm fascinated by it, is the, the, the synthetic, we've talked a lot about synthetic media and kind of deep fake detection and the rise of deep fakes. The, tech, the actual, uh, the underlying algorithms, generative adversarial networks that were applied to video to create deep fakes, that same technology is now being applied to text, which sounds kind of trivial, because like, okay, you have a text generation you know, an article written by a computer is not going to be as good, right? That's not actually what they're doing. What it's able to do is understand. So the NLP has also gotten better. So you can now look at unstructured text as a software developer and use pretty easily available APIs to be able to digest that and then come up with, to understand what actually what it looks like and then use that, whether that's to create short form text um, or, or longer form um, to kind of content digestion and so almost like regurgitation. I think that's, that's becoming really interesting uh, for a lot of companies that it sort of sits underneath where the consumers play for right now, but I think there's gonna be interesting consumer apps on that front. Yeah. Um, one question from my boss, so we shouldn't tarry on it anymore, uh, from Ned Desmond. Live events in the media world have come to a screeching halt. Do you think they will return to business as usual once the pandemic lifts? So, uh, so I would, so I'm, I'm gonna disagree with Ned. I mean, I think that, the live programmed events have come to a screeching halt, right? Like massively programmed events, um, and uh, you know, and the Olympics is now on hold, and so we've we've, but but there's a ton of events that are going on, right? And mm -hmm. so we do we do a ton of events at uh, smaller events at studios. We've moved, you know, eighty percent of them into virtual, and we've invented another. 30% of kind of events. And so we're seeing, you know, we do morning coffee at studios virtually. We do uh, events around uh, startup issues, startup discussions, and they're anywhere from five to 200 people on the events that we've done in the last 10 days at studios. So I think there's a lot of event stuff that's been, that's been reinvented. And so do I think it's going to go back to normal? I don't. I think it's going to, I, I think the, I think we've opened a door that we can't close now. 
and uh, and I think that most events, even you know, sort of uh, classic tech events like Disrupt, are going to have different um, virtual channels to them that you guys will start to experiment and think through and sort of see some really good use cases in the next couple of weeks. And you'll say, hey, we should add that to an event like Disrupt. And so I think all events are going to be slightly, uh, are going to be different. And they're going to have a, a, a virtual channel. They're going to have better back channels, right? Because it's always mm-hmm. been a challenge within events, you know, how to have a virtual back channel and make that work in a constructive way so people can chat and that it's useful. And then I think that they, many of them will have more permanence and will, the community will continue over time. And so I think it's an opportunity to reinvent events, right? And so, you know, there's a company which is in our portfolio, um, which is called TO um, and T-E-O-O-H um, uh, that is doing um, events that are represented by avatars. And so all of us would be little avatars and there would be a stage and, you know, the three of us would be on stage And you would be in center, Jordan, and people could stick up their hands in the audience and you would see them as uh, wanting to ask a question. People could whisper to other people in the room. And it's a uh, 3D virtual um, uh, event space uh, that is done. uh, It's not VR based. It's just uh, it just you, you you're looking at it on the screen. And so, um, so I think that there's I'm pretty sure that company was a disrupt battlefield company in Berlin. Tio, right? That is very possible. Yeah, Don. The, yeah, yeah, I'm familiar with them. I yeah. think the events change is entirely hinged. Tell me if you, disagree, you guys disagree with this, because I'm not sure I 100% agree with John here. The one thing that you get out of an in-person event is the ability to sort of serendipitously meet other people who are, who are for whatever reason, um, good fits, whether it's because you're trying to network, because you're trying to find a a like-minded person who to help you start a company, whatever that is, that networking component has up until now not been replicated in the virtual world, right? Which is why kind of online conferences, you know, yes, the content is nice, but people are there for the content and to meet other people who are interested in the topic. And I think right. if, if during this period, the technology gets invented and people are experimenting with, and certainly TO is experimenting with it, that solves that part of it, how do you actually meet other new people while you're there? then I don't think things go back to normal. I think, yeah, if, I, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I think, I think you're right. I do think that John is right. And that we've, we've opened a door. We can't close. Like once the virtual piece is in place, you can't really take it away. Like they're going to be, there's going to be a segment of the audience that either is solely focused on the content or um, just doesn't have either wants to pay less or, you know, just doesn't convenience wise, can't make it out, whatever. And you can't, you can't like pull that back anymore. There's going to be demand for it. I also think though, that there's going to be such, at least in the, in the near term, let's say this lifts, I think there's going to be a lot of pent up demand for exactly what you're talking about Hartman, which is like just serendipitously. Oh, like I liked that chat too. Like, what's your name? Who are you? Right. And Oh, lifelong friendship. And people miss that. Right. It's been, two and a half weeks and you can already sense it. So, um, yeah, I think both are true, right? I think both kind of come back both sides of that virtual and physical events are going to, I think, come back stronger, but I could be wrong about that. My opinion isn't as, uh, important as y'all's. So let's move on to Jocelyn Thornton. Any, any thoughts or advice to DMOs during this time? So Matt, I'm going to pass that one to you and I'm actually going to, my battery is about to die. So I'm going to sign off and sign back in a different device. Okay. Okay. Then, see you in a minute, John. I don't know what DMO is. I don't know what DMO is, is either. I, I was just assuming that you, you big brains would know. Jocelyn, if I you want to clarify what a DMO is, let me Google it and see what okay. Google says. Um, like Dungeon Masters? Destination Marketing Organization. Oh, so like, yeah, like uh, like um, Trivago or whatever, you know, the, the I mean, Expedia's you know, chart, of the world. And, which I hadn't seen until he pasted it here. That chart had, if you looked at the, the, one, the, 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 the apps that I noticed were that the travel apps were all like this, right? Nobody's yeah. traveling. 
no one's looking at prices of flights right now for the most part, right? And so I, my sense is that that's, you know, if I, if I were to sort of place a bet, it would be people are gonna be quite pent up after this quarantine period and really wanna be able to go outside and go to places. And there's a whole bunch of probably, um, there are a bunch of events that got, or either some got canceled and so that will be, that'll sort of be lost, but then some of them are getting rescheduled. I mean, I think that that's gonna be a temporary decrease. And then people are gonna to need to, in three months or five months or one month or whatever the amount of time that people are to come back and, and start to travel again. And probably the demand will be higher, not lower. John's in front of the diner, which is the diner across the street from our office. I wanted to think that the YouTube world knows that. I'm so jealous. My, my computer is not strong enough to, it doesn't have the force with it. Green screen and then it just does a really bad version of it. My computer's not strong I, enough. I don't want to do it. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, we, so that's where I, I, I think this is a temporarily, temporary, this is not a structural change in people not, not This is a temporary change that is going to have some pent up demand. And so it's really for those those DMOs or the, these companies that are these sectors that are being so badly hurt that have to go on pause essentially or freeze and you don't know when the end of that is exactly like what how do you advise them to get through that like that freeze right like particularly for those early stage companies who maybe don't have the cash in the bank or were planning on raising in you know mid April to start their cycle like what you know, I mean, how yeah. do they get out well, of that? On top of that, people talk on the investment side about sort of flight to quality. And, you know, people want to invest in companies that are, that not, all of a sudden for the last you know decade, it's been, or five years at least, it's been investing in companies, grow, 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 don't worry about profitability. And then, and then when the economy turns, all of a sudden profitability becomes valuable from an investor, not just valuable because you, your profitability won't die, but by interesting to more interesting to investors. And so you sort of have the double problem of if it's, I think if you're a company that's, that has a business model that's sustainable, then, then it's figuring out how to kind of just hunker down, just what we're doing, what we're all doing physically, kind of have to do as a company. I think that, that but, but if, it's a, if it's a company that was, look, we're gonna do a land and expand strategy and we're gonna just try to market the heck out of our product over the next six months, that's gonna be a problem if the demand's not there for the next six months and also, and yeah. so, a shift in in strategy um we kind of talked about this a little bit but it has three likes so i just want to bring it up again any big trends coming on audio medias bright from bryce um i mean I'll, gigodo well, yeah so so i i think the 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 we spent a lot of time in the kind of podcast side of audio but i think yeah. there's a whole other other piece of audio that we are excited about one is um, think about how data impacts, it informs audio in general. So that might be your consumer data, your location, things like that, but also synthetic voice. If you have a, if you have dynamic voice content, then the kinds of applications you can create totally change in audio for consumers. And right now, Siri reading something to you just isn't good enough, but we're starting to see uh, synthetic voice that's pretty interesting. Um, that's pretty good. It's not great, but it's getting pretty good. Um, second area is thinking about what the interfaces are where we interact with those. So I think over the last few years, it's been the rise of Alexa, the rise of Google Home. But thinking, but watching people's behavior in AirPods is really interesting. People are leaving them in for longer. If you look at the AirPod patent, it actually talks a lot about uh, uh, gesture recognition as a Q&A. So they, they talk about if there are going to be two uh, accelerometers in future versions of the AirPods. So when you go like this, it knows you're saying no. When you go like this, it knows you're saying yes. Wow. And they the developers. Then you can start dynamically asking people questions. You start to really imagine what a an audio app would look like, not just a podcasting app that that's that right. It, it's showing you for sort of content, but really sort of utility. I think that kind of stuff is what really is exciting. And then I think on the podcast side specifically, I think people are still trying to figure out monetization. It hasn't really changed. It's 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 um, advertising. It's people doing Patreon, but there's not. The, the form factors are just starting to change. And so uh, I think we're, we're interested in understanding where that could go. 
Well, and I think there's a big question too, when it comes to audio around like, what exactly is the content? Like what is paid audio content? A podcast is really obvious, right? But like a utility, like a voice utility, like what, what's what's the content? What's so interesting though, Jordan, is that you, in theory, podcasts are all free, right? But if you take a podcast and you don't put any commercials in it, and it's all about meditation, you can charge 15 bucks a month for it if it's in an app. If you right. take, you know, a, if you read a book out loud, you can put an audible and charge 15 bucks a month or 20 bucks for an individual book, right? It's, 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 I don't know quite why, but there seems to be a different consumer reaction to written content being, uh, people are very resistant to paying for what is ultimately written content, right? So I think media companies- Oh, I know. Trying to figure out what you know, the, the people are willing to pay for things like, uh, you know, video chats and events and, and it's, and the audio side, it seems like people are willing to pay for that. I don't know how long that'll last and, um, and what the real reason is other than, I mean, then you look at China and they have people who are paying for, to learn by course. So if you call something a course, it potentially, it might be a structure that's, that's as valuable as the content itself. Yeah. Okay. I want to get, we have just a couple more left and I know we're probably running short on time. Uh, Be Gooder has another one. What are your thoughts on the short and long-term future of esports? My favorite thing. I think, I, I, John, do you have thoughts on that? I, or, or Jordan? Are you guys in the esports world? We, 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 haven't, done, we haven't done any direct investments. Between. John, you're really quiet. Can you hear me now? Yeah, That's I can all. hear you better now. I'm typically a low talker. Um, but the... Uh, we haven't done investments in esports teams, but we've done a lot of uh, things around um, uh, sort of tools and around esports. I mean, mm-hmm. I think that the, I I think that you're seeing it, the world of esports was fascinating and was really in, was really interesting from an investment standpoint and from an innovation standpoint. You know, six twelve months ago, now it's only you know it's only more so because I think that people are people are within these games people's entire computing experience is being reconstructed within these games right and so you know you you can't think about Fortnite as just a place where kids are going to play a game it's their sort of the nexus of their entire social computing environment Mm -hmm. and so um so what you'll see around there is could you see you know uh, you know you you'll see very different forms of esports which will evolve, but could you see also performance stuff happening? I mean, you can see that there are celebrity uh, sportsmen and women who are jumping into uh, gaming in the last week, right? There's Formula One drivers who are jumping into uh, uh, road race games uh, and competing with kids, and uh, you know there's NBA players who are jumping into uh, jumping okay. into games. Yeah. And so, so, so what you're seeing is, I think you're seeing this sort of like, you know, this flattening of, of the world and people are, uh, you know, who would normally either not have the time, the inclination, or there would be so much barrier for them to getting into these, these games uh, are coming into them. And I think we're going to see a lot of different uh, innovation around that. Yeah. I mean, for what it's worth, be gooder. I, I'm not a VC, but I follow esports pretty pretty carefully and i will say that i think there's huge opportunity in the infrastructure play that that john's talking about a little bit when it comes to training stats recruitment i mean none of that exists right now there is no you know espn there's also a big giant wall between a startup and that infrastructure play for the most part which is called a game publisher, right? And yeah. it's it's different yeah. from something like the NBA where you have NBA the league, you have these, you know, teams and franchises that also have their say, and then you have basketball as a game, right? That is its own right. thing. A publisher is all of those things always for the most part. Um even if there are leagues and teams outside of it, it's really the publisher who controls everything. And when you think about what you could do to innovate on games, I always think why isn't there a filter when I enter a game lobby to play only with people who have their mics on? Why isn't there a filter when I enter a game lobby to play with 
people who are good teammates, right? Like, why isn't there like a team teamwork score, right? Or right. Um, a family friendly filter where if this person has been rated as using curse words and slurs, can I filter them out of my game? I don't want to be in a lobby with that person or on a team with that person. And that's all publisher. So, you know, at, at a certain point, you look at companies like Playverse, one of the first companies to really sign a big deal with Epic to provide high school and college esports for Epic. Um, so it's, it, it's possible. It's not impossible to do, but it is hard to kind of wedge yourself in there. Those publishers are mighty and they don't really, they don't really spend their time on the, the little guys and the little ideas, you know, they're just focused on their own thing. That's right. such a good I, I think when I look at the eSport category, it's, I, I think, you know, is it here to stay? It's like, it's its own category. It's a fact. It's like, it's a fact. eSports are a fact of life. Like this is not. Yeah, there's no here to stay with yeah. eSports anymore. So I think we look at it as a thing which exists. And then I, I liked your, your, the way that you described it, the, the, this, the dynamics of the industry are so different than the openness of the internet when mm -hmm. internet was for getting started. And so what we're trying to do, there are some, a couple of investments we've made, as John said, kind of in the, in the, in the, in the, in the sort of wedges where we think there's opportunity, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an extra filter that we constantly look at with something like these boys. I, I, I also wonder, Jordan, because I totally agree with you about the publisher and their control over the entire stack. I do wonder, so you could see innovation happening. So there's like, have you seen DJ Nice and what he's doing on, on Instagram? Mm -mm. What's he doing? So, so he started doing, so, so four weeks ago, we did a call with a, a friend of mine in Beijing who was under quarantine. And he started telling us about um, that they were doing what he referred to as cloud clubbing. And it was like, you know, Laurie Siegel did a interview with him. She put it into a podcast. There were a bunch of people who uh, on Twitter who were like, oh my God, it's Turntable FM again. How quaint. And <clears throat> here we are four fucking weeks later. And this guy, DJ Nice, is on Instagram doing cloud clubbing. And, you know, he had, I think he's had a couple of million people who have come into his, um, uh, his DJ streams. And he did wow. one session, I think, for eight hours. And so he's, you know, he, he's, he is, uh, he's on every day. And uh, so, so there's new behaviors that we're seeing emerge like this cloud clubbing thing, right? So that is entirely within a controlled stack. In this case, it's Instagram, it's our gaming stack. Does mm -hmm. that become innovation? In other words, does DJ Nice say, wait a minute, I can actually take this out of Instagram and create something here and work with either a startup to do that or build his own startup? or you know a dedicated service emerge around that which is called turntable fm time you know version two um i i think that that's entirely possible right now because again because of the organic access to um to sharing and uh i think we're going to see you know sort of things spin out of the big publisher stacks whether they be social media stacks like instagram or whether they be Fortnite, um that could be really interesting companies yeah, totally agree. Um, Anna, this is your last question. <laughs> Anna has one more. What do you think about the launch of Quibi next week? They are betting on short content slash quick bites being successful in a time where people binge hours of content. Ironic? It's a good question. What do you guys think about the, the Quibi launch coming up? Look, I have, um, I, I, I love to be contrarian, right? Somebody says up, I say down. And so people have been so down on Quibi, I've been up for uh, a bit. Um, I, I think that the, uh, I, I think that that team has, you know, I, I think the idea of creating very high quality short form content uh, is, is a gap in the market that exists. And it's been done by influencers incredibly well on TikTok and a bunch of other platforms, but it is not really, you know, um, it, it hasn't been professionalized. So I think that they're, uh, them being able to do that, I'm actually really intrigued with what they launch and with what the content's like. Now, is, is the content going to actually play in today's world? I think that's a question which I have no idea, right? Because I think that... Um, in, in today's world, people 
you know, they they want very, very different kinds of content. Uh, there's a lot of escapism, there's a lot of horror, there's a lot of dystopian stuff, there's a lot of humor. And, uh, and is their slate right? Um, because God, nobody could have ever expected that they'd be launching into this environment. But I think the Quibi, you know, who's reportedly had a budget of, you know, 200 million plus this year to spend on marketing. If they're smart about it, uh, they're going to be able to do a lot. They're going to be able to get a lot for that money. Yeah. This is, this is, um, Matt, what do you think? Uh, I'm going to have to run a second, but my my uh, my take on Quibi was just, I, I think it's all about the content. I think the form factor actually isn't such a huge deal even right now because people are still looking at TikTok. Shortly. <clears throat> do you think that the, uh, with big companies, and I, I don't know if it's big or not, what, what, what I think what media organizations, organizations think of as quality content is different than what people care about in terms of quality content. Like this is three of us on a Zoom call, but if you care about this content, then it's high quality content. If you don't, it's not, right? It's much more about the, the information that's being communicated through it. If I'm on Facebook or Instagram, a mediocre video of my cousin's baby is very high quality content to me. And so my yeah. question is, is this, but you know, there's Netflix stuff that's really good. And so you, and you, make, you make time for it. So I think my question is just what, I'm, I'm curious to see what their view of sort of what really high quality short form content looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and our bars are so high, right? Like I, I was just watching an old show that I watched in high school that I was obsessed with. Matt, maybe you're familiar with it. John, maybe you too. One Tree Hill. You guys remember One Tree Hill at all? Um, and I was just like, this is terrible television. I mean, it could not be a worse show. And I loved it. But like our bars are so high. Content is so good right now that it's like. You know what I watched last night, Jordan? I watched uh, an Alfred Hitchcock movie with Jimmy Stewart. I can't think of the name of it. It's the guy who broke his leg and he's going to move his apartment. I don't it, know that one. It was, oh, I gotta find out what it's called. It was it's awesome. Right there, right window. Uh, so he's stuck in his apartment, right? And he can, he can just see everything out the window. Yeah. And he sees the murder, yeah. Yes, exactly. And <clears throat> it was so, the, the, it was so good. It's just like the storytelling was unbelievable. And I think it totally holds up. And I like I was just as 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 uh, concerned for all the characters as if they were in HD. Yeah, it's I don't know. I I I'm enjoying One Tree Hill for the nostalgia factor. I'm like, oh look, simpler times. Like he's wearing a puka shell necklace. Like oh my gosh. Like remember that. Um, but it is terrible television comparatively to all the new stuff. Um, Matt, I know you have to go. I did have one more question that I thought we should get to. So if you have to dip, that's fine. But, but John, DJ Nice, for a question from D Web about what you were saying with DJ Nice. Can you see an event bright for digital events? Push notifications from Instagram aren't enough to notify those who want to tune in. Does Eventbrite have an opportunity to kind of be the host of this stuff? Or thank you, George. Yeah. Um... Thanks, Matt. So, I, I mean, I think it could be an Eventbrite, it could be an adjacent platform like an Eventbrite, or it could be somebody new doing it, right? And so, I mean, I'm more interested in new things. Um, and, you know, and I think that we're seeing people sort of hacking together these tools and creating sort of very new media, shared media experiences um, that are, and, and it's only been, you know, it's only been two weeks, right, or 10 days. And so it's just starting. And I think that what we're going to see is we're just, it, it feels like the early days of the internet a bit, right? Where there's been a sort of deconstruction of the, and a flattening of the tools. And you're seeing sort of people share and hack sort of pieces, you know, loosely coupled pieces are coming together to create new things. And so, you know, I think that, um, you know, this cloud clubbing phenomena is 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 one thing I think we're seeing that around future of work. We're definitely seeing it around, you know, areas of healthcare, um, and you know, I think we're going to see you know a whole bunch of you know, of new kind of behaviors emerge out of this. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, <clears throat> I appreciate you taking the time, John. I know you're a very busy, busy guy. So thank you for hanging out with me for an hour. It's a pleasure. It's nice to see you, Jordan. Look after really you, nice to see you too. Yeah, I can't wait till uh, we're we're COVID free and I can can come have lunch with you sometime soon. It's been too yeah. long. Yeah. Bye. All right. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye.